welcome everyone to this is the uh, final installment of this um, new directions in the study of modern Hinduism lecture series uh, for this term at least. It's a great honor and pleasure to have with us today Swami Medananda. Uh, um, Swamiji is a monk of the Ramakrishna order, order and senior research fellow in philosophy at the Ramakrishna Institute of Moral and Spiritual Education in Mysore, India. He is the author of numerous articles on Indian, German and cross-cultural philosophy. He has also authored a number of um, and, and authored and edited a number of important books in these areas, including The Dialectics of Aesthetic Agency, Reevaluating German Aesthetics from Kant to Adorno, published by Bloomsbury in 2013, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, Sri Ramakrishna and Cross-Cultural Philosophy of Religion, published by Oxford University Press in 2018, and the Bloomsbury Research Handbook of Vedanta, published in 2020. Today, he speaks to us on a theme from his most recent monograph, Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism, published in March of this year by OUP. The title, oh yeah, this is that, you may want to give that a, yeah. <laughs> the title of his talk today is the rather tantalizing from Advaitic inclusivism to yogic pluralism, a new diachronic interpretation of Swami Vivekananda's views on the harmony of religion. Just a brief word on format, um, this is a, a scheduled as a one hour talk today and uh, there'll be um, about 10 or so minutes toward the end, I mean at the end for a Q&A and also this is the first time we've done a hybrid event so it's both in person and online not just for this series but also for the OCHS so it's really breaking new ground at our institution <laughs> but yeah so please bear with us if we're sort of dealing with uh, some you know technical things but yeah hopefully everything goes smoothly fingers crossed so with that I'll hand over to you Swamiji. Thank you so much to Professor Lucien Wong for inviting me today and thank you all for attending I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I'll be discussing today Swami Vivekananda's views on religious diversity this is basically a summary of chapter three of my new book, which Lucian just mentioned. So I begin by mentioning briefly what I consider to be the mainstream scholarly understanding of his views on this issue. Most scholars seem to think that Vivekananda was an Advaitic hierarchical inclusivist. Um, Stephen Gregg is one example. He's a British scholar who published an entire book on this issue in 2019. And his main thesis is that Vivekananda was quote, no simplistic pluralist as portrayed in hagiographical texts, nor narrow exclusivist as portrayed by some modern Hindu nationalists, but a thoughtful, complex inclusivist who upheld the superiority of a monistic Advaita Vedanta interpretation of reality. And this interpretation of Vivekananda is quite widespread. Other uh, similar interpreters include Paul Hacker, Richard Neudfeld, Wilhelm Halkfass, Anko Barua, Raghuramaraju, Rigopoulos, and the list goes on. I'm going to be challenging this mainstream interpretation by defending a very new interpretation of Vivekananda's views. And I'm going to elaborate that, but before I do, before I delve into Vivekananda's views, I think it's useful to broach um, a conceptual issue. It has to do with how we understand the different paradigms for understanding the relationship between the different world religions. Alan Race was an American, uh, is, he's still alive. So he's a Christian theologian in the US. And in 1983, he presented a threefold typology, which has become extremely influential in both theology and philosophy of religion. He introduced the terms exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. But he was not sufficiently clear at least in the beginning when he first theorized these terms about exactly um, what these terms meant. So it, later scholars have pressed him and others to kind of clarify the different ways that uh, different world religions can relate to each other. So both Robert McKim and Paul Griffiths um, have argued that it's crucial to distinguish questions about the truth of religions from questions about their salvific efficacy. By salvific efficacy, I mean their effectiveness in leading to salvation. Um, questions about truth concern the extent to which religions provide an accurate account of reality. Questions about salvific efficacy concern, concern the extent to which religions are effective in leading to salvation. However, the term salvation and effectiveness are understood. And in scholarship on Vivekananda, I believe there's been a great deal of confusion and misunderstanding concerning his views on religious diversity, in part because scholars have not been sufficiently careful about specifying whether they are defining 
pluralism and inclusivism in terms of truth, salvific efficacy, or both. So let me begin by doing a little disambiguation and starting with clarifying, I'm giving my definitions of the three basic positions on the question of salvation. So exclusivism about salvation, which I abbreviate as ES, is the view that only one religion has a high degree of salvific efficacy and no other religion has any salvific efficacy at all. Inclusivism about salvation is the view that multiple religions, more than one religion has equal salvific efficacy or no, multiple religions have salvific efficacy but one of them has greater salvific efficacy than all the others. So they're putting, inclusivism puts one religion above all the others but doesn't dismiss the other religions as, as completely invalid, but just as somehow affording lesser forms of salvation. And pluralism about salvation is the view that multiple religions have an equally high degree of salvific efficacy. They're equally effective in leading to salvation. By contrast, there's another way of cashing out these three um, categories, exclusivism, inclusive pluralism, that has to do with religious truth claims about the nature of ultimate reality. So exclusivism about truth with the subscript U standing for truth claims about ultimate reality. The doctrines about ultimate reality in one religion are true while contradictory claims in other religions are false. My religion has a monopoly on truth, other religions are false. Inclusivism about truth, the doctrines about ultimate reality in only one religion are have the most truth, but the doctrines about ultimate reality in other religions have some truth as well, although not as much truth as are. And finally, pluralism about truth is a view that the doctrines about ultimate reality in multiple religions are equally true. So let's keep in mind these two different conceptual frameworks, one in terms of salvation and the other in terms of truth claims about ultimate reality as we move forward. So now we can get into uh, my interpretation. So I'm presenting in chapter three of my book, a new diachronic interpretation of Swami Vivekananda's doctrine of the harmony of religions. By diachronic, I mean that I'm arguing that his view actually evolves in the course of the 1890s. And I divide his thinking in, into three phases. And I'm gonna summarize uh, my thesis first, and then I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail and then I'd like to hear from you. Phase one, September, 1893, when he first came to the US and delivered the famous uh, lectures at the World Parliament of Religion, uh, in Chicago to March 1894, so it's a relatively brief period of a few months, he defended salvific pluralism, PS, in the sense just defined, and doctrinal pluralism, and what he calls the ideal of a universal religion. I'm going to get to that. It's a little cryptic, but I'm going to explain that in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, in, in the second phase, from September 1894 to May 1895, he defends an Advaitic salvific inclusivism and a doctrinal inclusivism based on the universal religion of Vedanta, which he explains in terms of the three stages of Dvaita, Vishita Dvaita, and Advaita. And it's this phase that I think most scholars, these mainstream scholars who believe that he was an Advaita inclusivist, they take this to be his final position. And that I think is a serious mistake because they overlook the fact that there's a phase three in his thinking. Phase three from late 1895 all the way to 1901, he passed away in 1902, so up to the end of his life, he adopts a very different position. So he defends a salvific pluralism and a doctrinal pluralism based on the universal religion of Vedanta, but instead of defining Vedanta in terms of the three stages, Advaita, Vishta Advaita, and Advaita, which would be inclusivist and hierarchical, he defines Vedanta in terms of the four yogas. And I'll explain what that means in more detail later. So that's the summary. Phase one, September 1893 to March 1894. This is a passage from his famous paper on Hinduism delivered on September 19th, 1893. To the Hindu then, the whole world of religions is only a traveling, a coming up of different men and women through various conditions and circumstances to the same goal. Every religion is only evolving a God out of the material man and the same God is the inspirer of all of them. Why then are there so many contradictions? They are only apparent, says the Hindu. The contradictions come from the same truth adapting itself to the varying circumstances of different natures. It is the same light coming through glasses of different colors. And these little variations are necessary for purposes of adaptation. But in the heart of everything, the same truth reigns. The Lord has declared to the Hindu in his incarnation as Krishna, I am in every religion as a thread through a string of pearls. And what has been the result? I challenge the world to find throughout the whole system of Sanskrit philosophy, any such expression as that the Hindu alone will be saved and not others. 
uh, here, I made a mistake in my PowerPoint, but I'm calling this a prism metaphor, which is not quite accurate. So the metaphor he's using is interesting, but they're different glasses, each of which has a different color. So there's a red glass and a green glass. So the light appears in these different forms based on what, what glass it's passing through. It's not quite a prism. But in any case, that metaphor suggests uh, doctrinal pluralism, the non-hierarchical view that the doctrines about ultimate reality in multiple religions are equally true since they conceive and describe the same God in different ways, right? It's not that one color is somehow superior to the others or more true than the others. He also derives salvific pluralism, PS, explicitly from his doctrinal pluralism. Since different religions have the same God at their center, they are equally effective paths to the same goal of God realization. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Now, regarding the universal religion, in the same paper, he makes a very interesting claim about a universal religion. He claims that Hinduism contains the seeds of a universal religion, but he doesn't straightforwardly equate Hinduism with that universal religion. He says the Hindu may have failed to carry out all his plans, but if there is ever to be a universal religion, so notice the, the tense here, it must be one which will have no location in place or time, which will be infinite like the God it will preach and whose sun will shine upon the followers of Krishna and of Christ on saints and sinners alike which will not be Brahminic or Buddhistic, Christian or Mohammedan, but the sum total of all these and still have infinite space for development, which in its catholicity will embrace in its infinite arms and find a place for every human being from the lowest groveling savage, not far removed from the brute to the highest man towering by the virtues of his head and heart, almost above humanity, making society stand in awe of him and doubt his human nature. It will be a religion which will have no place for persecution or intolerance in its polity, which will recognize divinity in every man and woman and whose whole scope, whose whole force will be created in aiding humanity to realize its own true divine nature. So in this first phase, he already was defending salvific and doctrinal pluralism, but he hadn't quite worked out the theoretical foundations of that pluralist position. And he did not quite believe that there was a, an existing universal religion yet, but he was working toward this idea of coming up with a universal religion which could ground and justify a, a religious, pluralism, religious pluralist position. I think he only arrives at that in the second and third phases. So we arrive now at phase two, September 1894 to May 1895. Now he begins to say that the universal religion is not an ideal, it actually exists and it exists in the form of Vedanta. And in this brief period of about nine months, he defines Vedanta in a very specific way in terms of What's, what some people call the ladder theory, the ladder of three rungs, Dvaita leading to Vishta Dvaita. So Dvaita meaning dualism, Vishta Dvaita meaning qualified non-dualism, culminating in Advaita, total non-dualism. And he defends this position in, as far as I can tell, in only four places in the complete works. So just a side note here, the, the complete works is Swami Vivekananda that has nine volumes and it's not chronolog chronologically ordered. So it's very difficult to do these kind of diachronical analyses. But um, two people in the US compiled a chronological ordering of the, of the complete works and they published it online. So I used that, it was very, very helpful. I, I cite them in my book. So it's on that basis that I've done this diachronical study. So the reply to the Madras address, um, the lecture, the religions of India, the lecture, Soul, God and Religion and in a letter to his disciple, Al Alasinga Pirumal on 6th May, 1895. And I'm just going to quote from that the final place where I believe he holds this second phase view. He says the following, all of religion is contained in the Vedanta. That is in the three stages of the Vedanta philosophy, the Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita and Advaita. One comes after the other. These are the three stages of spiritual growth in man. Each one is necessary. This is the essential of religion. The Vedanta applied to the various ethnic customs and creeds of India is Hinduism. The first stage, i.e. Dvaita, applied to the ideas of the ethnic groups of Europe is Christianity. As applied to the Semitic groups, Mohammedanism. The Advaita as applied in its yoga perception form is Buddhism, etc. So I think he's saying at least two things here. First of all, I think he's defending a, a Hindu doctrinal inclusivism because he seems to be claiming here that Hinduism is the only world religion that encompasses all three of these stages, Dvaita, Vishta, Dvaita, and Advaita, while all other religions correspond only to one of the stages. And he also seems to be defending an Advaitic salvific inclusivism, theistic religions like Christianity and Islam and theistic forms of Hinduism are placed on a lower salvific footing than Advaita Vedanta. And he's willing to grant the highest status to some forms of Buddhism, the yoga perception form, by which I think he means Yogacara Buddhism. 
but and here's the, the, the way I challenge the mainstream understanding of Swamiji's of Vivekananda's views. He quickly goes on to adopt a very different position on the world religions. From late 1895 to 1901, he teaches the harmony of religions on the basis of a Vedantic universal religion based not on the three stages of Vedanta, Dvaita, Vishta, Dvaita, Advaita, but in terms of the four yogas. Um, one caveat here, he did continue to teach the three stages of Vedanta in subsequent years, even after, uh, uh, so even after uh, late 1895. In both India and the West, for instance, in his 1896 lecture on the Vedanta philosophy at Harvard, and his 1897 lecture on the Vedanta and all its phases in Kolkata in India. However, after May 1895, he never again appealed to the three stages of Vedanta in the specific context of the harmony of religions. That's the point, that's the crucial point that I'm trying to make. Instead, in his lectures and writings from late 1895 all the way up to 1901, he taught the harmony of all religions on the basis of a Vedantic universal religion grounded in the four yogas. I'm not going to go through all the different writings where he, he de defends this phase three view, but I have them listed here. And if you're interested, you can look at chapter three of my new book. But I'm just going to um, give you a few examples in the following. So. Um, in phase three, while he projected the universal religion as an ideal rather than as an actuality in his paper on Hinduism in 1893, in his lecture, The Sages of India, delivered on 11th February 1897, he explicitly declared that, quote, Vedanta is already the existing universal religion in the world because it teaches principles and not persons. So the universal religion exists in the form of Vedanta. And in another, in another place, in an interview in London in 1895, he declares, I propound a philosophy which can serve as a basis to every possible religious system in the world. So from late 1895 to 1901, he held that Vedanta was the universal basis of all religions, which he consistently theorized not in terms of the three stages of Dvaita, Vishta, Dvaita, and Advaita, but in terms of the four yogas. Here's one place where he does so. This is from his lecture, an 1896 lecture called The Methods and Purpose of Religion. The plan of Vedanta, therefore, is first, to lay down the principles. Second, map out for us the goal. And third, then to teach us the method by which to arrive at the goal, to understand and realize religion. Again, these methods must be various. So now he's elaborating on this third, third aspect right, the method. These methods must be various. Seeing that we are so various in our natures, the same method can scarcely be applied to any two of us in the same manner. We have idiosyncrasies in our minds, each one of us. So the method ought to be varied. Some you will find are very emotional in their nature, some very philosophical, rational. Others cling to all sorts of ritualistic forms, want things which are concrete. If there were only one method to arrive at truth, it would be death for everyone else who is not similarly constituted. Therefore, the method should be various. Vedanta understands that and wants to lay before the world different methods through which we can work. Take any path you like, follow any prophet you like, but have only that method which suits your own nature so that you will be sure to progress. So unpacking this passage, I think he's saying that the Vedantic universal religion has three fundamental components. First, the principles underlying all religions. Second, the goal of all religions. And third, the various methods by which we can all reach this goal. Regarding the first, component. Earlier in the lecture, he explains that what he calls the grand principle of Vedanta is, quote, that there is that one, capital O, one, in whom this whole universe of matter and mind finds its unity, known as God or Brahman or Allah or Jehovah or any other name. So notice that he has a very expansive understanding of the divine one, which can be both the impersonal Brahman, but also any form of the personal God. Uh, the second component of Vedanta, the goal mapped out by Vedanta is the salvific realization of the impersonal, personal, infinite God in whatever aspect or form one prefers. And third, Vedanta teaches that there are various methods or yogas for attaining this common goal of God realization. Um, in this particular passage, he doesn't mention um, the four yogas. But in other places, he cashes out these methods, he generalizes them into four basic yogas. So for instance, in his lecture, The Ideal of Karma Yoga, he says, the grandest idea in the religion of Vedanta is that we may reach the same goal by different paths. And these paths I've generalized into four, namely those of work, love, psychology, and knowledge. Work corresponding to Karma Yoga, love, 
Bhakti Yoga, Psychology, Raja Yoga, and Knowledge, Jnana Yoga. So now finally, uh, I've been putting this off, but how, how does he derive the harmony of religions on the basis of the four yogas? This is how I see him doing that. This is my reconstruction. It, it consists in three premises, or two premises and a conclusion. First premise, every world religion corresponds to one or more of the four yogas. He says this, for instance, in his lecture on Sri Ramakrishna. A man may be intellectual or devotional or mystic or active. The various religions represent one or the other of these types. So intellectual corresponds to jnana yoga, devotional bhakti yoga, mystic raja yoga, active karma yoga. Second premise, each of the four yogas has equal salvific efficacy. He says this in a number of places, but this is one place where he says it very explicitly. He says, each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect even without the help of the others, because they have all the same goal in view. The yogas of work, karma yoga, of wisdom, jnana yoga, and of devotion, bhakti yoga, are all capable of serving as direct and independent means for the attainment of moksha. Somebody might say, well, wait a minute, where's Raja Yoga here? He says in his book, Raja Yoga, that Raja Yoga is also one of the four main yogas which can take us directly to the goal. He only mentions three here, but in other places he mentions all four. On the basis of these two premises, he arrives at this conclusion, and it follows logically from these two premises. Uh, he arrives at uh, salvific pluralism. Since each yoga has equal salvific efficacy, each of those four yogas, and each of the major world religions corresponds to one of these four yogas, all of these religions have equal salvific efficacy. And that's the definition of salvific pluralism. So he says this very explicitly in his 1896 lecture on Sri Ramakrishna. He says that each religion, quote, has the same saving power as the other. And beginning in late 1895 in phase three, he not only defends a salvific pluralism, he also defends a doctrinal pluralism. He claims that the doctrines in numerous religions are equally true since they conceive and describe the same ultimate reality from different but equally accurate standpoints. So he says this, for instance, in his lecture, The Ideal of a Universal Religion. He says, we must learn that truth may be expressed in a hundred thousand ways and that each of these ways is true as far as it goes. We must learn that the same thing can be viewed from a hundred different standpoints and yet be the same thing. Suppose we all go with vessels in our hands to fetch water from a lake. One has a cup, another a jar, another a bucket and so forth. And we all fill our vessels. The water in each case naturally takes the form of the vessel carried by each of us. So it is in the case of religion. Our minds are like these vessels and each one of us is trying to arrive at the realization of God. God is like that water filling these different vessels and in each vessel, the vision of God comes in the form of the vessel. Yet he is one, he is God in every case. So I think this metaphor of differently shaped vessels conveys, I think pretty strongly a doctrinal pluralism. He's not saying that one view is truer than the other views. Now comes an important question, why why did Vivekananda move away from the phase two view, the Advaitic hierarchical conclusivism, to the phase three view, this what I'm calling yogic pluralism? I think a hint is, um, uh, is it, we find a hint in his lecture on Sri Ramakrishna in the following passage. He, he begins by quoting uh, a famous passage from the Shiva Mahimna Sutra as different rivers taking their start from different mountains, running crooked or straight, all come and mingle their waters in the ocean. So the different sects with their different points of view at last all come unto thee. Now, this is his discussion. Vivekananda says, this is not a theory. It has to be recognized, but not in that patronizing way, which we see with some people. And then he ventriloquizes these imaginary religious inclusivists, it seems like. Oh yes, there are some very good things in it. These are what we call the ethnical religions. These ethnical religions have some good in them, end quote. Then Vivekananda continues, some even have the most wonderfully liberal idea that other religions are all little bits of a prehistoric evolution, but quote, ours is the fulfillment of things. Then Vivekananda says, one man says because his is the oldest religion, it is the best. Another makes the same claim because his is the latest. We have to recognize that each one of them has the same saving power as the other. So what he seems to be doing here is saying that religious inclusivism is not sufficient. We have to go further and embrace a, a, a robustly pluralist position. And I think that his description of a patronizing, a quote unquote patronizing inclusivist position serves as an implicit auto critique of his own earlier attempt to harmonize the world religions on the basis of the three stages of Vedanta. I think he reflected more as he was thinking about Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, the teachings of his guru, who was very broad. And he thought, wait a minute, but even my own 
position saying that on the basis of Advaita, we can ha harmonize all the world religions, you end up putting the theistic religions on a lower footing. And that's not what my guru stood for. And I don't think that's the best way to, to um, promote world harmony. So between mid-1894 and mid-1895, he held the salvific inclusivist view that theistic religions like Christianity and Islam and um, theistic traditions of Hinduism like Vaishnavism occupied the lowest stage in the Vedantic hierarchy of Dvaita, Vishta, Dvaita, and Advaita. So it's possible that one of the reasons he soon went on to abandon this Advaitic inclusivist position in favor of his final yogic pluralist view is that he recognized that his three stages view patronizingly relegated non-Advaitic religions to a salvifically inferior position vis-a-vis -vis Advaita Vedanta. Um, and I wanted to end by mentioning that he didn't stop with a religious pluralism, but he also urged us to deepen that religious pluralism into what I call a religious cosmopolitanism. So it's logically possible to be a religious pluralist, to believe that religions other than my own can equally lead people to salvation, but not at all to care about other religions. I can still just, because I know that through my religion, I'll reach the highest goal. So why bother with Christianity or Islam for, or for Buddhism, right? That, that's logically possible. He says, no, but you shouldn't stop there. Religious cosmopolitanism is the view that you should actively strive to expose yourself to other religions and to learn from them. And even to try to incorporate aspects of other religions into your own spiritual practice. And I think he gives two rationales for religious cosmopolitanism. The first is that since different religions provide different but complementary accounts of one and the same infinite divine reality, every religious practitioner can enrich and broaden her understanding of God by learning about other religions. So say I'm an Advaita Vedantin in the Hindu tradition. I believe in the impersonal Brahman as the highest reality. By learning about theistic traditions like Vaishnavism or Christianity or Islam, I can learn more about the infinite nature of God. I can learn about the personal aspect of God. That's just one example. And second, since each religion corresponds to one of the four yogas, and the ideal is to combine all of the four yogas to the fullest extent, the greatest help in realizing this ideal is to learn from and indeed even practice religions other than our own. Uh, I didn't have time to actually mention this, uh, this point that even though each of the four yogas is a direct path to salvation, Vivekananda repeatedly urges us to try to combine the four yogas to the best of our ability. And the reasoning behind that is that each one of the four yogas cultivates a certain aspect of the human personality. So Jnana yoga cultivates the intellect, Bhakti yoga, the emotional side of our nature, uh, Raja yoga, the contemplative side of our nature, and Karma yoga, the dynamic side or the will right, of our nature. So if we can cultivate all four aspects of the human personality, we'll make even more rapid spiritual progress and we'll have a, we'll have a more um, many-sided personality. So if we believe that, if we take that to be the ideal, and since every religion corresponds to one of these yogas, we can enrich our spiritual practice by learning about religions other than our own. Um, and so he expresses this religious cosmopolitanism, for instance, in the following passage from a 1900 lecture. He says, our watchword then will be acceptance and not exclusion. I accept all religions that were in the past and worship with them all. I worship God with every one of them in whatever form they worship him. I shall go to the mosque of the Mohammedan. I shall enter the Christian's church and kneel before the crucifix. I shall enter the Buddhistic temple where I shall take refuge in Buddha and in his law. I shall go into the forest and sit down in meditation with the Hindu who is trying to see the light which enlightens the heart of Everyone. So he's, I think what he's promoting here is what contemporary scholars call multiple religious belonging. There are different ways that we can theorize multiple religious belonging. There's one form of it, uh, which could be called the Kichuri theory, where you don't have your own home religion, but you just kind of mix and match different practices from different religions. I don't think that's what he's encouraging. He, he's encouraging us to remain grounded in our own home religious tradition and on that basis to freely draw on and learn from other religions. And um, I'm gonna leave it here, uh, but I wanted to mention um, that there are a number of lingering questions. Three of the most important questions are as follows. And if, if in the questions, if you're interested, I can come back to these later slides. But the first question is, I've been talking about how Vivekananda um, harmonizes the different world religions, but I haven't explained what Vivekananda's definition of a religion is in the first place. So how does Vivekananda define religion? That's one question, which if you're interested, I can uh, discuss that. I have a couple of slides on that. Second question, does he hold that all religions have equal salvific efficacy or that some religions have greater salvific efficacy than others? Remember that going back to my early slides on uh, my definition of pluralism, 
I keep using the word multiple religions, not all religions. So the idea is that pluralism isn't committed to the claim that every single religion in the world has equal salvific efficacy. It's just a view that more than one religion has salvific efficacy. So did he think that some religious paths are nonetheless inferior salvifically to other religious paths? And the third question is, how does he address the problem of conflicting religious truth claims? Different religions make directly conflicting claims. Christianity and Islam, for instance, or in its orthodox forms, don't accept rebirth. Hinduism and Buddhism do. And there are many other claims which conflict with, with each other in different religions. So how do you uh, teach the harmony of religions in the face of the fact that different religions make conflicting claims? So if, if you're interested in the Q&A, uh, I can uh, go on to discuss those issues. Thank you so much.